Now today, uh, we're finishing this series called Family Matters. We kicked it off uh, week one, just said, families matter to God, so family matters. And, uh, and so we talked a lot about how Jesus was born into a physical family. He also had a spiritual family that he was connected to. You can go back and listen. Then we talked about kids matter and the importance of parenting and, and, and not just discipline, uh, but discipleship and what it means to disciple the heart for life transformation and heart transformation, not for behavior modification. Then we talked to our moms. We said moms matter. And then last week we had a blast talking about communication matters. How many of y'all went home and took the test? Come on. Y'all t- yep, some of y'all didn't. You should have. You should get the book and take the test. I'm telling you, here's what happened. Uh, we talked, we had a lot of fun last week. We laughed uh, until we almost cried. And uh, we posted on social media this week. If you weren't here, you can go back and watch. It's, it's, you'd have to kind of be here to understand, but you can, you can watch. Uh, we talked about four different temperament colors, red, blue, uh, yellow, and green. And it was funny. We asked, what color are you uh, in your temperament this week? And it was funny who commented first. I'll give you a guess on who commented first on what colors they were. Reds were like, I'm a red. She's a blue. And, uh, and then the yellows jumped in, and the yellows put, on my page, they were putting all these, like, memes and all this stuff. And I'm like, they were over the top with it. It's like, chill. Just, just a post. And, uh, and then the blues were like, I'm a blue. And then they named everything else in their family because <laughs> they liked, like, order. And, and then, then, then the green showed up, like, a day and a half later going, okay, I guess this is safe. And they're like, I'm a green. It's just so funny because you really can see people's behavior come out based on their temperament. And uh, we said last week, no temperament is better than another, but all are uh, important to understand as we communicate. We'll talk a little bit about that more today. But here's the premise behind the series, because we're talking about mission matters today and what it means to live a life on mission and have a family that lives on mission. So write this down as the premise for our series, and we'll kind of come back to it. Every family is headed somewhere, but few families are headed somewhere on purpose. Um, let me just talk to my people, my old people in the room. Um, if you're over 33, 35, you qualify, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm well over that. But how many of y'all remember atlases? Come on, atlases. See, you understand what I mean by old people now. How many of you have no idea what an atlas is? Or you only know it because you read it in a book? Okay, see, anybody under like 33, they're like, oh, we're not too young for this. And, uh, and so it's funny because as you get older, I mean, like people in here, y'all realize there's people here who don't know what a phone book was, right? All right, so an atlas was uh, long before um, there was GPS on your phone, there was a thing called an atlas. And what an atlas was, uh, it was, if you had one of the state of Georgia, it was about this thick. If you had one of the U.S., it was like that thick. And um, every state had its own page. And it was maps is what it was. And if you wanted to leave your house right here, at, or, or a relevant church at 4770 Highway 42, Locust Grove, Georgia, and you wanted to go to Austin, Texas, um, you didn't have, you couldn't just put in an address and it tell you how long it was going to take to get there and then reroute you if there was an accident reported ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. You had to figure out how to get from here to the Alabama line and then cross every state thereafter in, from page, if you're in Georgia, it's like page 37. If you're in Alabama, it's page one. And then you had to go back and forth and figure it out. And you didn't know how long it was going to take. And you had to reroute and you had multiple options. That was an atlas. And so if you left 47.7, the Highway 42 in Locust Grove, and you started toward Austin without an atlas back in 1994, you were in trouble. And an atlas would just lay in the back floorboard of the car until you need, or the trunk until you, who, and then you, when you needed it, you were like, where we put the atlas? Oh my gosh. And then if you didn't have one, you had to go buy an atlas. I mean, this is painful thinking about it. We have come a long way. This is like, I know this for y'all who are even much older than me. I get it. My grandfather used to tell me, he said, we used to walk uphill both ways in the snow to to school every day. You young people don't have a clue. This is my version of that, okay? Uh, You don't have a clue what it's like to have to figure out an atlas and where you're at on the map. You had to go to coordinates and GPS. There was no like, like, you couldn't just drop a pin. I say that to say, if you left your house going to Austin, Texas without a map, you probably, unless you've been there before, assuming there's no road signs, you probably will not end up in Austin, Texas. In fact, some of y'all wouldn't know which direction to start out of the parking lot because Siri didn't tell you. I just think too often this is where families are. We have dreams and aspirations to arrive somewhere one day, but we have no road map on how to get there. And then we show up when our kids are 18, those of you who are graduating seniors this year, or our kids go to get married, uh, you, you start realizing, man, we probably should have had a better road map. Some of you realize your parents should have had a better road map. 
And if we could just program it into a computer and it tell us all the moves we need to make, it'd be a lot easier, but that's not the way life works. And so the biggest key for you to raising a healthy family, healthy children, healthy marriage, healthy grandchildren, you just name it, is to understand your family identity. Now, we talk about identity a lot when it comes to, you know, you as an individual, understanding your identity, first of all, how you were created, but also understanding your identity in Christ is the most important thing we can do. But there's what I like to call having a strong family identity. Like we know who our family is. And this is an identity in our family that's centered around Christ. Identity that is found um, inside of the context of the family. Here's what I mean. First of all, your family knows what family is. Come on, let's just start there. Because cultures tried to redefine family uh, in so many different ways. And so first of all, your kids know what a family is. It's it's not confusing to them. Like, they don't have to look around and go, what's well, a family? Because uh, some I heard a, one of my sons tell me the other day that there's a friend of theirs told him that, like, kids don't ask anymore um, if your parents are divorced. They ask if your parents are still married. And the response many times is uh, shock when people, kids will say, oh, yes, my parents are still married. That's different from when I grew up. So it's confusing, like, what even constitute a healthy family? And now we got identity crisis in our culture, and so everything is confusing. And so we have to develop a strong family identity, because if we don't, write this down. I'm going to give you a couple of contrasts here. Where family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. Where family identity is weak, peer pressure is strong. Now, some of y'all don't even understand what peer pressure is, because now it's called cancel culture or just bullying. But when we grew up, it was like there was kind of a set of behaviors that was appropriate. And then there was peer pressure to do other things. Y'all remember that? Now it's just you just define whatever the heck you want truth to be and do it, which is not at all what the Bible teaches us so we're clear. Just in case the next generation don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. So in a family that is strong, where there's a strong, healthy identity in your family, like you know who you are, you know how you fit into this family, then peer pressure is weak. You're not looking for things other places. But, but when family identity is weak, you're more susceptible to peer pressure and ultimately bad choices. And so there's two types of families when I, when I talk about families. That have, there's really three, but I want to talk about two today. There's what we call the interdependent family. These are families that are interdependent, healthy relationships with one another. They understand their value as individuals, but also as a family unit. Now, this is different from codependent. That's a whole other conversation. Codependent families have a hard time when their kids go off and get married because mom's too connected to the daughter and they can't realize husband's got to come first now. That's codependent families. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about interdependent families who understand their role, their identity in the family, and they rely on one another. And so here's what happens. They have their needs for acceptance, love, and affirmation met by their family. Do you see this? That leaves them less vulnerable to peer pressure or even cancel culture. So when you know who you are, you're accepted and you're loved, and you're affirmed by your family, you are less vulnerable to the lies of this world. Then there's what we know as the independent family. Now, this is where you live together, but you're not really inter interdependent. You, you live as individuals in a home. This is where husbands and wives live as roommates, not spouses. Where your friends, kind of, <laughs> on, on good days, but you're not really interdependent. You're not connected at your soul. Where Kids grow up, and they hit a certain age. It's like, well, we'll just let them grow up. And they, they're kind of growing up now. We'll let them kind of figure this thing out. Or, or we don't really know where we're, we're raising our kids and sending them off. And so this is where there's no strong family identity. This is a weak family identity. And this is where their need for acceptance, approval, affirmation, and love are not found. And so they go outside of their home this is why the 13-year-old girl who's broken in relationship with her father immediately wants to a relation. I got to find her. I fall in the arms of some crumbs from a table. Because maybe there's a broken relationship with the father. And so we got to help our children and our family understand their family identity. And so here's what I want you to write down, and we're going to unpack this together. One of the key components to building a strong family identity is living on mission together. If you haven't figured this out, today's title is Mission matters. And when I say living on mission, I mean the mission, the cause of Christ. Living on mission as a family together. So we don't just have our individual relationships with Jesus. We work as a family in our relationships with Christ, with our local church. 
and with our community of believers. And so I'm reading this passage of scripture, and then uh, we'll unpack it together. It says, it says this, it says, um, he who doesn't, it says, it says this, if God doesn't build the house, the builder only builds shacks. If God doesn't guard the city, the night watchman might as well sleep. You see this pattern here? And it says, what good does it do? It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. There's some guilty parties here. Don't you know that God enjoys giving rest to those he loves? Don't you see that children are God's best gift? The fruit of the womb, his generous legacy. Like a warrior's fistful of arrows, it says, are the children of a vigorous youth. In other words, the more kids you have, the more power you have, right? Not really, but that's what it's saying. Like the reality is, is if you show up at Walmart and you got nine kids, everybody notices, <laughs> right? And then it says, oh, blessed are you parents with your quivers full of children. You say, what's that? I'm going to tell you in a minute. Your enemies don't stand a chance against you. You'll sweep them right off your doorstep. And so the psalmist gives us this illustration here of um, a battle that's going on in a culture. And he talks about the importance of raising children and raising them in such a way that they can win the war against the culture around us. And so let me just kind of give you a couple things that I take away from this particular passage. And um, I'm not going to shoot this, so y'all be careful. It's not youth ministry. Um, let me give you a couple takeaways from this passage, and then I'll give you some thoughts. Here we go. Here's what I see in this passage. First of all, I see that you can build a house without building a family. You can live together, but work and busyness do not equal effectiveness. That's what this passage is telling us when it comes to building a family. It also tells us that kids are a gift. Some of y'all are like, they were, then they turned three. <laughs> and then they became a gift later when they moved out, Right? It also tells us this, kids are only ours temporarily. And then it tells us this, we get to launch them into the world. Some of y'all are like, yeah, no, not that kind of launch, okay? Some of y'all are like, well, talk to me, Pastor. My kid's 32 and failure to launch. Um, what do I do with that kid? Send him to me. We'll talk. All right, and um, so, so what he says is like, like, like a quiver full of arrows, you know what a quiver is? It's where a marksman would carry all of his arrows in this little pouch or container on his hip. So when he got ready, boom, he could fight off the enemy. And the premise here is when you build a strong, healthy family, you can make an impact on this world. So write this down. Your home is a training ground. Not just, oh, we just want to run. Like it's, no, it's a training ground. And training is tough. It's also rewarding. And so it's a training ground, but here's what I want you to also write down. It's also a launching pad. So it's a training ground that one day becomes a launching pad. So I've said this to our church many a times. Our home should be a refuge from the world and then a springboard into the world. Here's the problem. There's too much world in too many of our homes. There's always sin in the world, but you don't have to pipe it into your living room. I don't have to pipe it into my kids' fingertips. Let me give you some examples. So um, if, you're, if you're a refuge from the world, that means we, we're required to protect our children from certain things at certain ages, right? Not allow them to be exposed to certain things to the best of our ability. Not everything is in our control, but there's a lot that is in our control. And so research shows us over and over and over that too early exposure of children to certain things and certain messages creates havoc in their brain, in their psyche, emotional development, and spiritual development. To some degree, even in their physical development, which I'll show you in a minute. And so let's talk about it. If a child is exposed to violence at an early age, 3, 5, 10, 12, they don't know how to process this. And now not only mentally are they struggling, but emotionally they're struggling. 
They struggle physically. They struggle in their relationships. They're less likely to finish high school or go to college or be able to keep a job or be able to keep a relationship in their future because of the violence they were exposed to at an early age. A child who is exposed to sexual images or any kind of sexual um, fantasies out in their, in their life when they're 5, 7, 10, 12, 15, if they're exposed to these things, what happens is it, your brain will rewire itself. I don't know if you realize this. And now not only they, they can't even see relationships in a healthy way, but it damages, again, their emotional health, their psyche. It causes shame. It causes all kinds of things. And the average age of a child being exposed to pornography now is nine years old. And we're wondering, how, how in the world are our families being a ref- You know where? On their cell phones. And if they, don't, if they don't have a cell phone, on their friend's cell phone. Or at their grandma's house when they're away from you. You'd be surprised. And then... If you want to fast forward a little bit, kids who are maybe, don't, they, they see mom and dad split up. You see how this trauma affects them at an early age. Or let's talk about social media for a second. Studies are showing now we, we have actually data that shows the effects of social media on children. And we see the effects of Facebook. Then we saw the effects of Instagram. And now we have Snapchat. And now, well, now we've advanced from Facebook book to TikTok. Hear me. Studies are now showing kids are developing, literally developing tics from watching TikTok. Like they're overindulging in the anxiety and causing physical breakdowns from their mind to their body because they're overwhelming themselves because they're being exposed to too much too early. And so hear me. The first messages about things are the most important to your child. This is why at three years old, you better be exposing them to the right things in the right seasons and the right spaces. Whether it's, you know, healthy relationships or sex or what the world has going to throw at them, teaching them in healthy ways what to expect, but not letting them be exposed. This is why I am anti, you know, social media and anti-technology for kids up until a certain age, probably much later than probably you would think. Because early exposure, we now have studies that even prove what I think the Bible teaches. And so we say this in the church world a lot. We say, the great, a great commitment to the great commission and the great commandment will grow a great church. Now, I'm going to unpack this because I want you to see some things. We're talking about living on mission together. Well, what do you mean living on mission together? Well, if we're going to be a, a, a refuge from the world and a springboard to the world, while we have our children, some of you don't have children, your grandparents, your single grandparents, your single parents, or maybe you're living alone, but you have most of us have some component of the next generation that we can impact. And so if we're going to live on mission, we got to understand what that mission is if we're going to launch students or kids or young adults into this world. And that is a commission, the great commission, a mission to the great commission and the great commandment. Well, what are those two things? If you didn't grow up in church, let me read you Matthew 28, 19, 20. It goes like this. Jesus said to his final words to his disciples before he would go to heaven, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is his command to all believers. And teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What is Jesus saying? I came to this earth to start a movement, to change people's lives, that people would move from death to life and follow me to eternity. Now he gave that commission. That is, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, you said, I want to know God's plan and God's purposes for my life. For you to ever understand saying the specific purposes that God has for your life, you need to understand we have to be faithful to this general purpose. We are all called to the world to share the good news of Jesus and teach what it means to follow Jesus. That's what his command, that's the great commandment. Then the great, I'm sorry, the great commission. Now the great commandment is this. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Then he he says, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so what we have said historically, if you want to grow a church, if you want to make an impact in your community, you got to be committed to going and making disciples and loving your neighbor as yourself. That's what we told pastors and churches. And we teach that like, if you're not committed to these two things, how do you expect God to bless your church? So, Let's take that to its smallest unit, the family unit, which is God's design for humanity. A great commitment to the great commission and the great commandment will also grow a great family. 
You see, we have to instill this in our homes. We can't have it in the local church until we have it in our homes. We can talk about it, but if, if we're all independent of one another, we're not moving in this direction with mom, dad, you know, teenagers, kids, whatever, moving people toward a greater cause on this planet, then we're just showing up for an activity on Sundays. And so a great commission and a great commandment home is when your family lives on mission together, where you love Jesus together, where you love each other the way Christ loved the church and you love your neighbor together. See, this is hard when your neighbor offends you, isn't it? But Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And this is also when everybody in your family as a whole, listen, wants to bring more people to Jesus. Have you thought about that lately, like your neighbor? Like loving your neighbor as yourself means telling your neighbor about the never-ending love of Jesus. Sharing your faith, what it means to find wholeness in Christ. And so I just want to give you kind of five things to get us started, and we'll, we'll unpack them real quickly. They're kind of old school preacher points, but we'll have fun, okay? If you want to live on mission together as a family, let me give you five things. Number one, you as an individual have to develop a deep personal relationship with Jesus. It's real simple. It's real simple. Like you have to develop a personal, like you don't get to ride mama's coattails on her relationship with Jesus. You, you have to develop that yourself. And so this means I need to be connected to my local church on a regular basis. This means I need to know who I am. This is why I think we have to understand our temperament. Like, because we, you know, when things happen, we need to understand why we respond the way we do. We got to know ourselves. We got to know our past and our trauma. See, some people have never dealt with their trauma, and so they have a hard time trusting the, the God of the universe. I said this a few weeks ago as we talked, I think it was last week, we were singing the goodness of God, and I said, some of y'all have a hard time singing that because you don't feel like God has been good to you. And we got report after report after report after report from people saying, you have no idea how that moment made me see God differently because I realized I got to deal with some stuff. And so when you do, some of you say, I've dealt with it. No, you've just buried it. And burying it is not dealing with it. Burying it's hiding it. Know who you are in Christ, that you are a son or a daughter of God. Pray, worship, read and learn God's word, not just the next devotional that's out or the next book that's recommended. Like, what does God's word say about you? And in doing that, your relationship, you love God and you love others as a result of your love for God. This is where the great commandment comes in. It's an overflow. Take you back to the week we talked about kids and we said discipleship versus discipline. You know, it's a whole lot easier to have discipleship in your home when it comes from an overflow of a personal relationship with Jesus. Otherwise, it turns into discipline. Don't do as I, as I do, do as I, yeah, y'all had parents like that, didn't you? You don't do what I do, you do what I say. Well, well, let me question that. No, you don't question me, right? It's hard to disciple when that's the way you live your life. But when it's an overflow and they say, well, dad lives like that. Mom lives like that. It doesn't mean dad and mom are perfect. They're authentic about their struggles. But the reality is, is they live like, you know, this for Jesus. And so I want to, I see that modeled. I want to live like that. Then discipleship in your home becomes a lot easier. Here's the second one. So you, personal relationship with Jesus. The second one is develop a deep relationship if you're married with your spouse. Yeah, this means, mom, your husband comes before the babies. Dad, your husband comes before the kids, even when they're 14 and they play sports. You got you to gotta learn your temperament. You got to learn your spouse's temperament. You got to learn their trauma. You got to learn their background, their pain. You got to learn to communicate with one another. You got to learn to serve one another. You say, well, I'm just not wired like that. Well, you better get some new wires. <laughs> because marriage is spelled, it's a four-letter word. It's spelled W-O-R-K. Marriage is work. And if you ain't ready to work, don't get married. Put the other person first. You say, well, they don't put me first. <laughs> well, you just put yourself first by saying that, right? Well, they don't put, if they put me first, I put them first. Well, you just put yourself first. Put the other person, the other spouse above your, your children because one of the biggest groups of people in our culture, especially after COVID or during COVID, that experienced depression we're empty nesters. Because I couldn't go, like, I don't know what to, I, like, I'm just sitting at home looking at somebody I hadn't talked to in 18 years. It's, it's a depression amongst people who are seeing their kids graduate and go off to college or move to another state or do whatever. Man, it's, it's real. 
because they don't have the depths of that relationship. And your kids need to see that relation, a healthy, godly relationship where mom and dad pursue one another, love one another, serve one another, honor one another. Here's the third one. Develop your generosity together. Like, well, that was good, pastor. Now you can go and talk about money. Well, I'm just talking about, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about a generous heart. That's where we have to understand what we're talking about. Do you know there is tremendous power in talking about giving with your family together? So we talk about it with our kids on three different levels, and we, uh, they know this about mom and dad, and then, of course, they have been talked to about uh, tithing and, and giving and the different seasons of the year give. But here's what we say. As a family, we tithe. That means we give God our first and our best. You say, what's a tithe? According to the Old Testament, and Jesus affirms it in the New Testament, the first 10% of everything we have uh, we bring to God our, our paycheck, our, 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 our all, I'm sorry, our um, allowances or our whatever it is, commissions you want to call it at your home. Or if they make money on a job, we, we bring the first 10% to God as a tithe through the local church to make sure the local church is there to support the community. Second thing we do, we give far above that. But the second way we do that is we find special causes and give above and beyond the tithe. So every year when tax season comes, we give above and beyond. We give above and beyond just normally anyway, but then come Christmas, we look toward, I can't wait to what we're doing in October. I'm so excited to share with you what we're doing to bless our community. But then come Christmas, we actually give our year-end offering uh, way above and beyond our normal tithes because we want to be a blessing to this community and make a difference. Uh, and we also believe that how you end one season of your life directly impacts how you end another. And so we want to end by just being uh, radically generous. And then the third way we do it, and we talk about this as a family, is we practice random acts of generosity together. Now, we don't do this all the time. But if we're in a restaurant, I love going to um, a Waffle House after Christmas services. Because those people don't want to be working. And so almost every Christmas, we'll roll up into a Waffle House, and uh, we'll eat. And, you know, the bill's only like $7.27 for a family of four. <laughs> and um, my kids almost know inevitably, Dad. How much are you going to give the waitress this year? Sometimes it's 50, 100, 200, not 500 yet, but one day I'm going to drop $500 on a Waffle House waitress and she's going to lose her mind or he's going to lose his mind. And you know the tears, by the, when they see that, the tears running down their face even before we get out of the building. Our kids see that. They know that. So a few years ago, I told our kids, uh, my youngest is, uh, I mean, he'll give you, I'll show you, he'll give you the shirt off his back. I'll show you something in a minute, but then my, my oldest, he's kind of like, oh, let me think about that. I'm going to be more, I'm a blue, I'm methodical, and get my return on investment. <laughs> and um, so we're getting ready to give it a Christmas offer one year. And um, we asked our little guy, I was like, how much are you giving? He's like, I'm going to give $100, Mom and Dad. I'm like, all right, what you been selling? And um, no, we didn't say that. Uh, our kids are savers, and they get, you know, they got grandparents who love them. And uh, I was like, that's cool. And I was like, this will be fun. I get to ask the oldest, what are you giving? Because uh, he's a little more, I mean, he, he'll give, but he, he going he gonna to make sure. And so I thought for sure I was going to look at him and say, man, your little brother gave that much. So I looked at the oldest. I think he was about 13 at the time, maybe 12 or 13. I said, how much are you giving? He said, oh, I done decided I'm giving 200. I said, I'm super happy, but I really wanted to rail you out, you know, make fun of you, you know. <laughs> they just kind of know it's a part of it. Here's my point. We want to raise our kids to be financially stable and successful, right? We try to help them create budgets and habits don't overspend, don't, you know, live on a budget and save for the future, then why wouldn't we teach them to invest in the greatest movement in the history of the world, their local church, and ultimately invest in eternity, whether they ever see it on this planet or not, they're laying up treasures in heaven. Why wouldn't we teach them that? Here's why. Because we don't want to do it. And we're not careful. We, we, don't, we can't teach our kids that because then we'll be saying, do as I say, not as I do. My youngest, like I said, will give you the, uh, the shirt off his back. If you can move him emotionally, you could rob him blind. <laughs> Where my yellow's at. <laughs> like, oh, man, here you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you just move him yellow emotionally. But, and then us reds are like, stop. Stop moving him emotionally. Stop it. You, you know, and so like, uh, have y'all seen the, um, the video where you can, um, like you can uh, help save elephants? So it literally says you, I'm going to show it to you. You can symbolically adopt an elephant. Symbolically. You just, can somebody unpack that? Like symbolically adopt. Like imagine that I'm going to symbolically adopt a child. 
How does that play itself out? They don't, I don't. So he saw this commercial I'm about to show you, and I, I think, I mean, he was ready to give his life savings. Take a look. Elephants. We feel a deep connection with these sensitive giants of the wild. Do we, though? Yet there is something you should know. As many as 30,000 elephants are killed each year by vicious criminals as demand for needless ivory trinkets explodes. But with your help, we can make a change. WWF is working around the world to address global threats to wildlife and their habitats, such as poaching and illegal ivory trade. We need your support now more than ever. For just $8 a month, you can symbolically adopt an elephant and help save them and other endangered species and their habitats. To adopt now, call us or visit mywwf.org and receive a free adoption kit as our way of saying thank you. Elephant lives are at stake. Come on now. Help save them now. Why that? That, that, that was, that's photoshopped. Come on, like, so we get to the end of this. He's like, Mom, can we symbolically adopt an elephant? <laughs> Y'all remember growing up, um, the Humane Society commercials? And the arms of the You don't know the words, you're just like. <laughs> I want you to imagine. They've been doing that for years. It's like, elephants. We all have an emotional bond. Do we, though? Do we have, when's the last time you really thought about an elephant? If you did, you're like, oh, man, at the zoo. <laughs> Imagine walking in on a Sunday morning and it's like, people. They're dying and going to hell. They're far from God. Every second, somebody takes their life. If you don't give... You're a bad person. You'd feel manipulated. Oh, and then, and then uh, uh, you'd feel like the church was manipulating you, wouldn't you? This is why we don't do like five minute teachings about offering every week. Because listen, if you want to be a part of the cause of Christ and you want to be a part of the greatest mission in the history of the world and you love Jesus, we want generosity to be an overflow out of your life, not a manipulation into your pocketbook. I'm not going to tell you you give $10 and God gives you $100. You might give $10 and have a blowout on the way home. Because the Bible doesn't say just because you give, you get back. That's what preachers say to manipulate you to get in, there, in your pocketbook. I will never do that as long as I live. Because at the end of the day, if God never gave me another thing, he's already given me enough in Jesus. And so then... We have to teach our children early to be generous by living generously. This means serving your church also. So you're not just generous with your treasure, right? You're generous with your time and your talent. Time, talent, and treasure. And so I want my kids to remember not what we stored up on earth, but how we made a difference in eternity. Here's the fourth one. Go to war for your family on your knees and with your family on your knees. And so this is not like you just go through the house and like put oil all over stuff and pray over it and be all weird. Are you asking, Pastor, will you come do that? No, I won't. And uh, Pastor Mark will be happy to do that for you, but not me. <laughs> um, and so like, it's not weird. It just means like, man, like you're, like you're passionately saying, God, you lay down at night. I don't mean you do this to pray yourself to sleep. But like, God, like, would you just stir up something in my children for you? Would you just let them see an overflow of my relationship with you so that they too desire to have a relationship? Would you prepare their hearts now for their future wives? Would you prepare their hearts now to make a difference? You see how we pray for them. And then you don't have to be anything overly spiritual, but every single night, man, we go to bed. I'll go to bed. Both of my boys would sit on the edge of the little futon there and, and when I'm dreaming, we pray together. And like sometimes I'm like, okay, guys, can we mix the prayer up? Like, it's the same. Like, we don't want to get in the mundane routine. But they'll remember, like, hey, we don't go to bed without spending a few minutes with Jesus. You've heard the, the family that prays together stays together. I'm not saying that's universal. But there's a lot of truth. That you, 
There's a lot of bonding that happens in those moments. And the next generation needs us praying with them and for them like never before. So we pray for them like never before, but we also spend some time praying with them. And so go to, go to war. I mean, there's a military component to this. Like, hey, there's, there's an enemy showing up on your doorstep. That's what the scripture said. You'll be able to wipe them free. So prepare your children. Here's the fifth one. Release your kids for significant impact. Release your kids for significant impact. Here's the problem. Don't get mad at me when I say this. And if you're a teenager, don't get mad at me. I love you. I'm playing the long game here. Hopefully you'll thank me one day. You don't release your teenager at 12 years old to technology in the world and expect them to be able to comprehend it. You don't. Their brains are not wired for that. Here, okay. In Jewish culture, at 12 years old, do you know that the Jewish boy could recite the whole first five books of the Bible? Like just boom, boom, boom. They memorized it. If your child can do that, you can give him a cell phone. Some of y'all are like, I don't like it when you talk about this. I'm just telling you, listen, I'm telling you because I love the next generation. I'm going to fight for them. This is me fighting for them. But releasing is hard. Sometimes we release them too early. And a lot of times, you ever heard, so if I want to release an arrow, it's ready. <laughs> All right. Aim. Aim. Aim, 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 fire. But if I pull this thing back and release it too early, the arrow never gets to its intended target. I got to pull it all. This, this is the hard part of parent. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. You see? Okay. And now I got to steady it. After I've got it, I've still got to steady it. After I pull it all, all, oh, man, I'm pulling it too far. Like, it's hard to even get it. And then once you get it all the way back, man, if you let it go too early or you, you get distracted, one distraction. Ready? Aim, fire. But here's what's really happening in our culture. Ready, fire, aim. Ready? Because Jalen's mama let him have it. Let him do it. I'll just let mine. Billy's mama let him do it. Well, dad, everybody gets to do that. Why can't I? Because we're aiming at something. And that right there would be a distraction. And I got to keep you focused. And listen, listen, son, I'm pulling this thing back. I'm pulling it back. I'm pulling it back. I can't just, I just can't come over here and let it go. I got I to gotta stay. St it's my job to keep you steady until God releases you, until you launch. I got to keep you as a refuge until this place becomes a launching pad. Because when it becomes a launching pad, there's an enemy that seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And so here's what happens. Three basic levels that most people in the world live at. The first one is this, survival. That means we're getting by. <laughs> you ever heard somebody say, we're making it. We're getting by. That means we're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, and we're surviving. But I, this also means like in your marriage, like I tell people who, who want to get married, I'm like, listen, I don't want your marriage to thrive, survive. I don't even want your marriage to just succeed. I want your marriage to thrive. We got people out there like, we're making it, but you, it ain't good. And there's some components, like some things you ought to do before you get married that'll help your marriage thrive, and then you, you prepare to actually deal with it. Because when you, no matter how much you do to prepare, you ain't ready. You ain't. You thought you were authentic. You thought you were real, and then they learned the real you when you moved in. And you just live at this. We're making it. We're surviving. Second one is this. We're, we're successful. We're doing well. I mean, look at this new house. Look at this new car. Look, look here. Look at my Instagram filter. Like, we're doing well. Like, I make enough money. I'm going to leave my kids an inheritance. Oh, my kids ain't in jail. They're going to college. They're doing, like, we're doing pretty well. And then the third one is significance. 
This is where you make a difference on the world around you. And I don't mean like, oh man, like I, you know, in Venice, I mean like for the cause of Christ. Like an e- eternal difference. And here's the problem. Most of us have dreams for our children that stop at level two. I wanted to be successful, get an education, have babies. and No, no. Yeah, I want them to marry. I want my, my kids to marry someone who isn't crazy, who isn't an idiot, who, who can, you know, manage a relationship. I want them to marry, if I have a, a daughter especially, I would want her to marry somebody who's not abusive. I mean, yeah, I mean, I want all that. I mean, I want them to go get some kind of education and, and make sure they're ready to take on the world and get married. And let me reverse that. Get a good job, then get married. Because listen, sweetheart, if he can't keep a good job, he ain't ready for marriage. Because marriage, I told y'all, I don't know if I told y'all this yet, I told first service. Marriage is a four-letter word. It's spelled W-O-R-K every single day. So if you ain't ready to work at the workplace, you ain't ready for marriage. And then have babies. Like, there's an order to this process. But is that all there is to life? Financial stability, happy kids, happy wife, nice home. No, can I propose to you there is way more. And the most significant thing you can do for your children and for your family is leave a spiritual legacy of living a life on mission to the cause of Christ. Period. I want my kids, listen, I'm going to leave them an inheritance. I am. As long as they don't do nothing stupid. Because we worked in real estate and business on the side, we're going to leave them an inheritance. But, but I, don't, I don't want them to remember me for that. I want them to miss the impact I had on this world when I was here. And I want them to go, because dad and because mom held the line. Listen, mom, say, hold the line. Come on. They held the line. They held the target. They didn't get sidetracked. When the enemy came in like a flood, they said, no, 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 no. We're going to allow the spirit of the Lord in our hearts and in our minds to raise up a standard against it. And we're going to protect our kids and then launch them out into a significant way of living, an eternal way of living. One that says, what lives beyond me is more important than what lives while I'm here on this earth. That's what it means to live a life on mission. And so, yeah, I have dreams for my kids. And it goes a little something like this. I mean, if I could say, yeah, I'd love my kids to take over the church and do all that kind of stuff in one day. I mean, sure, that would be my perfect scenario, but they don't need to live that, under that scrutiny. It's like, you know what? I want you to grow up. Love Jesus passionately. Love your church. Help people find Jesus. Love your wife. Love your kids. And whatever God calls you to do, you do it all for the glory of God. And if that's standing on a stage like this, great. If that's in a hospital room, great. If that's on a mission field somewhere, great. If that's something else in your community, great. But it is not about you. It is about Him. 100% of the time, it is about, listen, my cause is Christ. His cause is the local church. He died for his bride, the church. And so whatever you do, never forget that, kids. Never forget that I don't, we don't live in isolation. We're a part of a physical family and a spiritual family on mission, all doing our parts. The Bible says we are all a part of the body of Christ. You know what? That means some of us are big toes. You cut your big toe off and try to walk around, see what happens. You're going to stumble everywhere. You'll appreciate that. Some of you are like, I feel like an earlobe. I feel like I have no significance. No, every part of the body matters and is incomplete without the other. Just because you don't stand on stage or hold a microphone or sing a song or play an instrument and nobody knows your name, you have significance in the body of Christ, but you've got to know your identity in Christ. So let's live a life on mission for the cause of Christ, and let's change the world. I want you to stand with me. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to dismiss. If you want to get involved serving at Relevant Church and 
There's something called Welcome to Relevant. It's going on right now. We'll pick it back up in August. So many people travel during the summer. Um, but we'd love to get you plugged in. We have about 30 student leaders that are here every Wednesday night in our youth ministry. We need about 300 because if we want to reach all the high schools around here, come on. That means when you ride through and pick up your kids and you're like, man, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And can I tell you, most of these kids' parents aren't in church. So we need you. Our kids' ministry, man. Whew. The amount of babies COVID brought into this world. <laughs> Nothing else to do. Like we got baby, we just got kid. And I, thank God. But we need you. Not because we can't function, but because we can't continue to change the world. And so I want to pray over you and I want you to go home and figure out what it is you need to do to live life on mission with your family. God, right now, all across this room and watching online, I pray today that there are people that will deepen their relationship with you, that will understand the importance of deepening their relationship with you, personal relationship with Jesus. Whether they're married, single, live alone, have kids, they just, they, it doesn't matter. We all got to deepen our relationship with you. And then if they're married, God, to deepen their relationship with their spouse, to understand what it means to pursue one another and honor one another and serve one another, to develop a plan to be generous with our time, talent, and treasure, to seek you for our kids in the next generation. And God, then hold the line long enough to launch them for significance. For grandparents and aunties and uncles and relatives in this room who have an impact on children that don't live in their home, I pray you help them to grow closer to you and take that step as well and have a lasting eternal impact. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said.